these, it's, it's, it's not ruling us today, is not a party as brutal, as openly brutal as uh, the Stalinist uh, Russia was. It's not a, um, it's not yet a police state imposing upon us to say that two and two are five, but the police state, of course, every single one of you knows, is certainly closing in both here and in the United States for sure and certain. The police state took a great leap forwards with 9-11, that's for certain, and I hope none of you believe that 9-11 is what it was presented to be. It was, of course, the two towers came down, but it was absolutely for certain not two aeroplanes which brought down those two towers. They were professionally demolished by a series of demolition charges from top to bottom of the towers. If you doubt that, uh, look up on the internet 911mysteries.com. I mention this, you may find I keep mentioning this in sermons. Why do I keep mentioning this in sermons? Because truth is at stake. Because if the towers were pulled down by two aeroplanes, then the party is virtually in control. The party has got hold of people's minds. The party can push over all kinds of propaganda and lies in its media. And if the people swallow the lies, they will be enslaved. Our Lord said, the truth will make you free. The corollary of which is, lies will enslave you. At the moment, the whole world is being told lies by these media by the government, by the politicians, by the universities, by the teachers, and worst of all, alas, by the cardinals and the highest authorities in the church. We are being enslaved by lies, and a tremendous, the most outstanding global lie of recent times to enslave the minds of all of us, or to deceive the minds of all of us and thereby to enslave us by making us all believe that the police state is a good thing and a necessary thing, which is why the police state has advanced in leaps and bounds as it has. The most extreme example is 9-11. And that's a classic example of, a, of an enslaving lie, two and two are five. Those towers were brought down by two aeroplanes, and it was an aeroplane that struck the Pentagon. That's totally impossible, that an aeroplane struck the Pentagon. A commercial aeroplane has a very soft nose. There's, there's, you don't have a nose of titanium and steel. That's not what an aeroplane could fly with. If you, tried, if you tried taking off with that, it would nosedive immediately and lift it off the airport if it had such a heavy nose. The nose of a commercial aircraft is very soft. It's just a little aluminum uh, covering, aluminium here, covering uh, the radar of the plane, which is usually up in the nose. The nose is very soft. Whatever hit the Pentagon went through six, punched its way through six of the ten 18 inch stone walls between outside the Pentagon and its inner courtyard. There are five rings of buildings, each with an outer and an inner wall, and whatever hit the Pentagon went through six of those ten walls before it came to a stop. The photographs are there, the evidence is there, it's clear as clear can be. The, uh, the newspapers, of course, did not publish those photographs, but they do exist. Then it can only have been a guided missile which struck the Pentagon. Can only be. Guided missiles have a tough nose, titanic, titanium and steel, with an explosive charge of two charges. One charge to penetrate the wall which, have, which it, that they're penetrating, and then the second charge to explode inside. And that's exactly what the photographs show, with a fire running up and down inside the, the outer ring of the Pentagon. So we were all of us told, and I hope none of you still believe, that it was the work of three commercial airliners pirate, uh, piloted by 90 Mohammedans, uh, who of whom, as you may well know, seven are at least are known to be alive and walking around. Lies, lies, lies. And that's where it's at.
lies or truth. And you have today some decent non-Catholics like George Orwell, a decent and intelligent man. Some decent men who realize that what is at stake here, even before, in a certain sense, in a certain sense, even before religion is the problem, even before, even before God is, is in question, there's truth. Does there exist truth? Is there truth? And Winston says, freedom is to say that two and two are four. In other words, freedom, Winston's idea of a good way of life is a way of life with freedom. Freedom is his measure, like for many people today, is his measure of goodness. But instead of saying, instead of Winston saying like many people today do, freedom means the freedom to be able to say that two and two are five. That's what many people today understand by freedom. Freedom is a dangerous ideal. It's precisely indeterminate. It's because there's no truth in it. It will ultimately undermine truth. But in any case, uh, uh, Winston's measure of a something healthy, something sound, something different from the totalitarian world all around him, Winston's idea is uh, that the basic is two and two and four. If only two and two and four are still maintained, then we've got an anchor on which truth, objective truth can hang. And if there's an objective truth, then man is not number one. And that's what modern people don't want to hear. Modern people want to pretend that man is number one. In other words, that man replaces God. When Pius X became Pope, the great Pius X, at the beginning of the last century, in his first encyclical, he said, the problem is, and this is a hundred years ago, a little over a hundred years ago now, 1903, he said, the problem is man trying to take the place of God. That's exactly it. And um, it can't be done. Uh, man is still trying to do it, uh, and he's trying to... He, 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 since he is number one in his own mind, modern man wants to change everything that comes from God. Modern man wants to prove that he can dominate, just like O'Brien wants to be able to dominate two and two or four and change two and two or four, or change it at least in, at least in people's minds. Similarly, modern man wants to take any reality of God and twist it, change it, dominate it, to prove that he is God and not God is God. And the result is that, uh, that Pascendi in Pascendi, Pope Pius X, his great encyclical, which will be uh, probably the subject of a conf a, the next conference I am um, able to give here. Uh, it, uh, this year is the anniversary, the 100th year, a few weeks ago, earlier this month, September the 8th, it's just a few weeks, two weeks ago, uh, the anniversary of uh, Pascendi. And in that encyclical, Pope Pius X says exactly the same thing. He says that modernism can, is based on this philosophy, on modern philosophy, whereby man cannot know beyond the appearances. Man sees the, the cream-colored wall, but he can't know that behind the, the cream-colored appearance, which is also slightly cold to the touch, and which you can hear if you hit with something hard enough, behind, beside, behind the sense impressions which come off the wall, what is actually behind those impressions we cannot know. So says modern philosophy. Why? Because if, modern, if, the, if, a modern, if man picks up the appearances of things but doesn't know what's on the other side of the appearances, then he makes what's on the other side of the appearances, and that's modern philosophy. Phenomenism, phenomenology, Phenom the phenomena of the appearances. And so phenomenology is the idea that we don't and cannot know what's on the other side of the appearances. It's lunatic, it's madness. But again, man says, okay, uh, the appearances are given, yes, but it's I who make them, the things what they are. The thing in itself is unknowable, das Ding an sich, Immanuel Kant. It's I who make it what it is, in the same thing. A truth comes from God.